from Title On Air. Welcome to I'm in the Band. I'm your host, Allison Wolf. I can see what you're trying to say to me if I don't explain it away. I'm in the band and I deserve to be here and I do anyway. So in this episode, we hung out with Katie Alice Greer and Danielle, with one L, from the DC band Priests. I lived in DC for a long time. I liked the music scene, but hated the suits on K Street. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Oops, I'm squeaking in my chair. Anything, anything you want, anything you want. A lot has changed there since I split town, but priests seem to be breathing new life into that scene, with a community of bands and their label, Sister Polygon Records. Katie, Danielle, and Gideon, their guitarist, started the band in 2012. Their lyrics touch on serious issues, but Katie, she knows how to keep it pretty fun on stage. You know what is intolerant? Is voting a rapist white supremacist into Oval Office. Priest's most recent album, Nothing Feels Natural, came out just after the inauguration of 45. Two days after the election, Priest came out to LA to play a show. Of course, everyone was so freaked out, and Katie just started ranting. Trump's office burned down in North Carolina, but because we respect democracy, we have to give them money to start up their office again. Uh Like, no, you're shit out of luck if this Uh happens. Katie and Danielle stopped by my apartment recently for a little chit-chat. I am Danielle, and I play drums in the band Priest. I am Katie, and I sing in Priests. Danielle always, like, she cannot, say, she cannot anything. say, she it's always says it singular, like, Priest. I tried she to can't. do the second S, but I can't. In my head, like, I see the word Priest, <laughs> but I can't say it. I had a lisp when I was younger, and I had to go to speech therapy about it. Okay, this is so crazy. But I had oral therapy when I was a child because I sucked my fingers till I was like 12, which is really weird. And it was like deforming my teeth. And they're like, we can't give you braces until you stop sucking it on your fingers. So I had to go to this person who would like do all these mouth tricks to teach me to like sit my tongue at the top of the roof of my mouth because that's where most people do it. And like I would have to do like lips training exercise to make my lips stronger. Like I'd put a button on a string and I'll hold it in my lips as strong as I can, and they do this thing where they pull it back, and when it pops out, it shows you how many pounds your lips can hold. But I just just thought I was like a freak, and I was like really embarrassed that I sucked my fingers, but I did eventually stop doing it and became like a normal adolescent, ruled solely by insecurity. Um, (laughs) But the weirdest thing though is I do have a speech impediment, and I have my whole life, but I didn't know it until someone else with a speech impediment pointed it out to me when I was, like, 27. Now I feel like a fucking jerk for being like, Danielle can't say our band name, right? <laughs> like, I didn't even know that you have a speech impediment. And, but Damn. My, my friend who does have, like, a very strong lisp pointed out to me, and I was like, oh, my God, you're, you're right. Me and my best friend in, like, first grade, she couldn't say her R's. She said them, like, W's, like, Elmer Fudd. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so we would make fun of her, like, crazy. Aww. We always made fun of her because of that. But then all of a sudden, I'm in speech therapy class sitting next to her. I'm like, wait, me? What did I do wrong? <laughs> but I couldn't say my S's. And it's funny because when I think about it, they go again. It's like... <laughs> um, anyhow, I wanted to... Start with a little bit about just kind of like where you guys are from, where you where you grew up, how you grew up, um, kind of what kind of child were you? My dad's a minister, so my family moved around based on where my dad was assigned. So I lived a few different places. I think when I was a kid, I thought that I was going to become an actor. also wanted to be a hairdresser at one point. Yeah, I don't know. What about you? I guess, like, the standout fact, again, about my childhood is that I was a competitive figure skater, which, like, when you do that, it's kind of your entire childhood. Wow. When did you stop doing that? Um, so I started when I was three, and then I got to high school and, like, got really rebellious and, like, hated my parents. And I still skated because I loved it, 
and I taught to make money. So it was like my job. So I was still skating until I was like 18 or so. But I really got and got off the Olympic competitive tip by the time I was, I think, 13 or 14. It's interesting. You know, I did gymnastics competitively, too. Oh, my brother did gymnastics. Really? Yeah. You don't meet too many guys. That's cool. Okay, anyways. By the way, I have precious videotape of you ranting on stage at Red Cat when you played here in L.A. When I walk over here, I was, like, texting with my mom. Did any of our relatives vote for Donald Trump? And, like, she told me that some of them did. And I was like, well... I don't think I can really, like, have Thanksgiving with them. It's really more that, like, I'm trying to not ruin your holiday by not, like, like getting physical with my family, you know? Like, I will fucking punch somebody, like. Uh, yeah, this is a new song. It's called Suck. Back to music. It was not long after the election. It was, it was the, the day, day after. It was the day after. We, we, we all went to bed that night, like, horrified, obviously. Woke up early the next morning and had to go to National Airport. And, like, I did not want to see any of this news coverage, and we just couldn't escape it because our flight got delayed. We had to go sit in the terminal. There's, like, all these giant screens everywhere on CNN, like, running, you know, Clinton and Trump faces. And then, yeah, we got to L.A., and we had to play the show, and I just couldn't help it. I was just in such a weird headspace. I shouldn't call it ranting. It's kind of like, I sometimes can get a little stream of consciousness. You know, my default has always been like, if you voted for Trump, you're a shit bag. And like, you know, maybe you are, but like, you might also be a person who is under like wildly different assumptions about the way the world works than I do. Mm-hmm. Not being a, a Trump voter apologist, just, you know. Well, and you catch more bees with honey than vinegar. <laughs> like, I think that was like really interesting things about when we talk about like what caused the big tilt in like LGBT politics and acceptance within the US, you know, we saw that flip about like five years ago where gay marriage became, and, like it happened really quick, it, it seemed like perception wise. Psychologists trying to say like, what made people like all of a sudden like turn so fast. And it wasn't someone trying to proselytize you and tell you, obviously, right? It was, it was actually being close to somebody that, in a completely non, you know, relate to anything context it's like your grocer or the woman that cuts your hair or like whatever or you know one of your children or one of your nieces or nephews or something that's all of a sudden they're gay and then it's not just like you can't just be like an outsider group you know what I mean that you have to actually like so I almost sometimes do think like it does seem silly like how can I put politics aside and just like become friends with someone that voted for Trump but actually maybe I think in a lot of ways it's more helpful like don't try to dive right into fighting them about their politics right off the bat like why don't you get to know them as a person and let them get to know you and respect you and then just by the fact that you just are who you are and hold that like I didn't vote for Trump and I have reasons for not doing that you know I think you can win over a lot more hearts and minds in that kind of quiet strength it's like you're backing down but you don't necessarily need to like shove it in someone's face I once had a conversation with someone who talked to me in those twilight hours, those times when your mind is on fire, when you can't sleep because the creative and analytical possibilities before you are endless. He said those are the times he wants to write. I understood him, but I was also flabbergasted. I couldn't comprehend his unabashed enthusiasm. It was as if he didn't know the other side of that. The other side I find to be so intrinsically attached to those moments when your mind becomes a rocket. No words. You're like the son of a preacher, man. Well, <laughs> yep. kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool with me. <laughs> Can I ask? You're in a band called Priest, so what do your parents think about this and um, y'all being punk and whatnot? I would say the first five years of the band, my parents were kind of like, hmm, that stuff that Katie does. Yeah, I mean, they were sweet. They would come to see us, you know, when we'd, when we'd play in town, but like didn't, yeah, didn't really understand what I was doing. The Tides have, like, turned with that a little bit, I guess, because we're, like, more of a professional band now. You know, Iggy Pop tweeted about playing one of our songs on his radio show. Like, some markers that, like, my parents can recognize as, like, 
you know, you're doing something. And now they're like, they love it. They're like the biggest fans. There's like some songs now that they're like, oh, you're not shouting. Like, that's good. The name, I think, I've always just had like a fun kind of like teasing relationship with my parents about like, like I think I've been a pretty vocal atheist since I was an annoying teenager. So like, you know, me calling the band priests. And then we went to go stay with my parents for the first time on tour and like Gideon and Danielle were like, oh, so this is why you called the band that? Because your dad's a minister? And I was like, no, but I mean, I guess like read. I didn't think it was like, conscious like intentional i was just like and there's some freudian like subconscious like signals going on here but uh that was yeah isn't it weird how you never think about that like my last band sex stains Mm -hmm. yeah i I didn't tell my dad oh we're just called the stains for a long time (laughs) and then he came here for graduation and we played a show and on the like right before the the show you know he's like so now what's your band name called again (laughs) And I was like, oh, and my stepmother just grinned and goes, oh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, she knows because she's on Facebook. And then I was like, that's so funny. Well, it's called Sex Stains. <laughs> and he was like, wild name. <laughs> 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 so, well, so did you guys have any acts of like rebellion or any kind of defining moments in your childhood or teens that maybe kind of set you on the path to alternativeness or punkness <laughs> or? Okay, standing up to my parents and facing the fear of not being loved by quitting figure skating was, like, a really big one for me, like, quitting competing early on. And the most formative thing, I think, for my adolescence when I was in high school was I was a Francophile from a very young age. Like, I discovered Godard and Truffaut and was, like, obsessed with the French New Wave and, like, just knew that's what I wanted to do. I just, like, wanted to study French. And so I was trying to spend my junior year in France uh, to go to high school there. And I applied through this program through Phillips Exeter Academy, like all these like snobby, super, you know, private school kids. And I got rejected. But I think like that lesson in failure and picking up from there and like creating a totally different path, you know, in the shadow of failure and just like living in that space, which also I think built up a penchant for liking like a certain type of invisibility. It was really sh- formative. Katie? Um, I wish I had a story, like a defining moment like that. I don't think I really do. Uh-huh. I know a good story. What? The one where like your mom found out you were sneaking out to the oh show. My god. Oh my god. Okay. So this is kind of just a funny story. It's related. But yeah, like my mom and I just fought a lot when I was a teenager. My mom was incredibly strict, kind of controlling, honestly. Sorry, mom, if you're listening, you got to agree with me at this point. But like, I was like, just really had a nasty temper, loud mouth, really like bad attitude. And my friends had gotten me tickets to go see Snoop Dogg and Bone Thugs in Harmony in Detroit for like my 15th or 16th birthday. I was very excited about going. And then I got grounded like the day of the show. And I was like, you can't do this to me. Like this is going to be the most important like I was convinced like you know I was gonna like smoke weed at a concert and like party and it was gonna be so great it was like very important to me (laughs) my mom said I couldn't go and I like stomped upstairs to my room and then my friend she was like we should just still go anyway and I was like yeah 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 so I don't even know how we did this because I didn't have a cell phone at that point I think maybe she just called my house but she was like I'm gonna pull up and I was like great yeah I'll just like run out and jump in the van or it was it was a jeep she had a jeep So, yeah, like, Ashley pulled up, I jumped in her Jeep, and we were like, yeah, like, high-fiving, like, we did it, like, we're gonna go to the show, it's gonna be so sick. And then we're, like, driving out of my neighborhood, and Ashley's like, dude, I think your mom is following us. And, like, we look in the rearview mirror, and my my parents had, like, a big white conversion van, and (laughs) there's my mom, like, angrily driving down the street. We, like, get to Ashley's house and like jump out I like go run and hide in her basement it was like a reverse hostage situation because I was like hiding in her basement my mom's like banging on the door there was like a stakeout for like 45 minutes and finally Ashley was like I don't think your mom is leaving dude like we can't go to this show if you're still here and so finally she had to like turn me over and then I was grounded for probably like six months longer
Since I was grounded so much, I spent a lot of time when I wasn't at school uh, by myself. A lot of times if I was grounded, I couldn't use the computer or the internet in the house, but you know, when I could, I spent a lot of time just trying to like look up music that I had heard of. I knew that there was like more interesting music than the radio. I grew up in a suburb. I know a lot of suburbs have punk scenes. Mine did not. I was into like mall punk, which I got into through uh, actually going to Jesus camp when I was like 12 or 13. But I never like, I never really uh, strongly identified with punk specifically because I didn't, I didn't grow up going to shows like you know, that was like a kind of music that I was into. I didn't really know that punk was like existing in real time, probably until I moved to D.C. Um, the first show that I saw when I moved to D.C., I went to American University, and the very first week that I was there, Ted Leo and the pharmacist played in the cafeteria. Gideon, our bandmate, was actually at that show, and we didn't know each other then. We didn't meet for like another four years. And then the first time I saw a show in D.C. proper was at the Black Cat. <clears throat> My favorite band at the time, The Gossip, came to town and Miko Miko and Arisa Rada were on tour with them. So it was just like a wild show to see. Yeah, it was like, it was incredible. I had never seen anything like it. And that was, like at that point, yes, I knew of like Bikini Kill and Bratmobile. But again, I was kind of under the impression that like these were things that happened a while ago. Like punk isn't a thing that's happening. And then I, I kind of felt like a small town, like naive person. Cause I realized when I moved to this cool East Coast city, like, oh wow, like punk is a thing here. Like there are active bands, you know, like, that's so cool. What year did you move to DC? That would have been 2006. Mm. It was actually not very full um, because I don't think the gossip had really blown up yet. I think it was maybe the tour for Standing in the Way of Control. So they were probably like about to. I would have to go find it somewhere, but like I have a photo of me with Beth after the show because I loved her so much. And I like, you know, went up and was like, Can I get a picture with you? But it ain't your When I moved to New York around 2007-ish or something, I remember everyone in New York complaining about hipsters all the time. And I was like skipping down the street going, yay, as long as they're not suits. Okay, I noticed the exact same thing when I moved to D.C., but in the reverse. Because I remember when I was like in Williamsburg, it was kind of like, who's a banker? Who's an artist? I don't know because they're all dressing like boho, whatever, like wannabe bohemians. And when I got to D.C., I remember I... I kind of got into punk and got into this like a lot more like abrasive um, aesthetic and culture because the lines of the same were so much clearer in DC. It was like, you work for a lobby and like you're not from here and you don't care about the arts. Like the people who are like lobbyists in DC don't pretend. They were like, no, I'm rich and powerful, motherfucker. Like I have been the vice president's ear, you know? Mm -hmm. You get this anti, like you almost want to be more punk in DC because you want to be like, I'm not a fucking suit. That's for goddamn sure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and that's what I'm thinking about. Like when I lived in DC, I lived there from kind of off and on from 91 until 2007, 8, something like that. And I was like the weirdest person around. I got like harassed constantly for like the bright colors, for, you know, riding a bicycle, actually. No mm -hmm. one rode their fucking bike back then. Right. I, I rode my bike get everywhere. bottles thrown at me when I used to ride my bike back in like the early 2000s. Yeah. People like, try to drive you off the yeah. Did people try to drive you off the road? Run Insane you thing. I just want to throw um, a 40 at my bike. I had someone throw a 40 at my head. Yeah. Oh it was God. fucking <laughs> crazy. Yeah. I was uh, like, why do you hate me? Like, what did I do? I was just yeah. Like, yeah, so it's the, I was kind of embracing it when I went to New York. I was like, "Yay, a bunch of weirdos! I can just blend right in here." You yeah, know? totally. Because in DC, it was it was kind of harsh, and and also within the scene. So the scene was maybe still is really small, and I felt like the thing about DC is it's kind of like 
people vote extremely liberally there. I know that. Mm -hmm. Like politically, they're pretty right on in their minds. But for some reason, they act so socially conservative. And I felt like even within the scene, it just felt really like squeaky clean, like everyone's super straight and yeah. super breeders and let's have babies. And, you know, and it just kind of drove me crazy. And at some point I was like, I can't grow old here. Yeah, I so. think when I first started, this is no shade to anybody uh, in D.C. as an individual, but like the vibe as a community there when I started going to shows was very, very judgmental, very suspicious of people who you didn't already know. And to some degree, I understand that in a community because you kind of want to protect what you have. But anyway, uh, it feels to me like right now, musically diverse I don't feel like I'm going to shows where like it's three of the same sounding bands over and over again I always get kind of weirded out if I'm in a community of music makers where it feels like everyone kind of comes from the same socioeconomic background or like maybe they're all just white people or something but uh I think it's it is less that way in DC now than maybe it used to be it seems cool feels good well so and I think you're right I think things are really different in a lot of ways now and it almost kind of makes me jealous because I'm like, God, I wish I lived in that D.C., although I don't think I could afford this D.C. True. Yeah. But so I, I, I would like rather have the old prices and stuff. Right, right. But um, I think that you guys have had a lot to do with creating this community that's kind of a community of like, I don't know, introspection and resistance and speaking out about things with your label, Sister Polygon well, Records, thank you. right? I mean, but also your band, Priest. And maybe you guys could talk about forming both the band and the label and how did it create community? I didn't really know any musicians. I didn't know too many people. When I met Danielle, who also was brand new, like had literally just moved to town that week, and was like, yeah, I like can play drums. I was like, great, we got a band, good. Uh, I didn't really know Gideon. Uh, he had dropped out of the college I went to the first semester I was there, but like saw him at a show and was like, you know, yeah, let's jam. Oh, okay, like let's really jam. But it was like we didn't come together in a sense of like, oh, this like great scene and like we met each other at shows and like that we didn't really feel like we were a part of a scene. So like when you come together in that way, it's sort of freeing because you don't have the unspoken social codes that maybe coalesce from a community like we really were just like freaky weirdos not in the sense of like we were trying to do our own thing and then yeah. miss something else that was going on that was pretty pervasive i was not drawn to like discord punk all that kind of stuff i moved to dc which was weird in the music community you know to be like i want to make music and i don't care about any of that and so when i got to play shows i found a lot of freedom because i was like I couldn't have played a show in New York. I'm like, I don't give a fuck what you think. But I could in D.C. because I, A, didn't know these people. And B, from the outside, it didn't seem that cool to me. I did feel a weird combination of, like, middle fingers up, like, we don't care if you like us. But at the same time, like, I actually, like, knew about quite a lot of bands that came from D.C. I knew of, like, quite a lot of people, you know, musicians were in the area who, like, I really admired and, like, kind of, like, wanted to impress or, like... Yeah, you and Gideon I was, knew like, a lot more about like, that than I yeah, did. Yeah, Gideon and I could just go on and on all day back and forth of, like, oh, well, do you know about this one or do, what about this record or, like, blah, 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 blah. we do interviews and I, like, mislabel Discord band. They'd be like, oh! Yeah, like, they're like so embarrassed. They didn't know like the roster. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was a weird combination of like childish petulance, being like, "I don't care if you don't like us," but then also wanting to make something that, you know, the people who I thought were cool would would think was cool. Well, I know Erin Smith from Bratmobile. Like, you know, she's always my scene report in DC, and oh, she's, man. and it's great because she told me, you know, when all this stuff was coming up, she was like oh my God, you won't believe it. Like there's all these young girls who are super politicized way more than we ever were. And oh they, they're right on and they're making music and they're fun and creative. Erin is like so important to priests. Yeah. She has probably been at more of our shows than any person. Like she has photos of like, 
probably our second show. I think like Thurston Moore's band was playing that night and I remember her telling us like I'm gonna like bring Thurston to your show we were like oh my god like and then she was like okay well he couldn't come but like he said to me like he said your band name he was like I want to see the priests and we were like oh my god like just you know I do want to like backtrack and say like it is always so flattering and nice when people try to credit us with like spawning some kind of movement with our record label or band but like I don't think any of us think that like that was something that we did it was like there are so many other people who like have such a genuine love of music and like specifically the music of our town I think people like that are really what sort of built whatever is happening in DC right now like there's DC is a great place musically because like in New York, I think when people start bands, for whatever reason, they have to sort of think about it in the professional track right away. Maybe it just is how expensive it is and how difficult it is. But like, in D.C., there's there's not a lot of infrastructure for thinking about your music that way. So, like, people make music without the sort of, like, dollar sign in mind a lot. Um, it's sort of, and like... And fostered that way. Yeah. Because there is a history of, like, community music, community around music, you know, that's non-commercial. I do think you have to have an identity and a love for it that exists outside of trying to like be famous or popular or something. Well, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love DC. There are so many things I did there that I don't think I would have done somewhere else, especially not in New York. Mm. But I think at some point I felt like I just kind of had to give up and let go and be like, fuck, we have to give this city up to the assholes. (laughs) Because it always felt like the assholes were encroaching and that the scene was so small and you're just up against so much, like, really, like, man spread, you know? Yeah. And it was, like, <laughs> and it was aggressive. Like, I was, like, aggressively harassed all the time by all sorts of drunk jocks everywhere. Damn. And then, so, when Aaron was telling me about all these cool girls starting shit up again, I was, like, wow, oh, thank God. That's so cool. I hadn't even thought of it in that context, but, like, I can see how DC kind of has this, like, macho guy vibe sometimes. Um, Are you looking at your clock? Yeah. yeah. Tell Gary to fuck off. I love the new album, and there are some songs that I was thinking about, but um, there's the song Pop. Yeah, yeah. And you talk about someone naming their band Burger King. Yeah, that was Gideon. Wait, so did he really name a band Burger King? <laughs> it was like King? a What's conversation in the van. Like, you know, you talk about stupid shit when you're on tour. And at one point, out of the blue, Gideon was like, what do you think about naming a band BK Home of the Whopper? And I was like, that's the stupidest band name I've ever heard. And he was like, I think it's pretty good. So, like, it came from that. But, uh... Like, the song wasn't literally, Like a you know, springboard for about something that. else. It was more about, like, it took us a really long time to make that record. We had to record it twice. You know, we all had our shitty jobs that had, like, let us leave for a while to go record. And, like, you know, then we're, we're just, we're all in debt, all this stuff. So it kind of became, like, okay, well, I guess we'll, like, hire a publicist. And, like, we'll, you know, we'll try to do this record in this sort of professional way that didn't really make sense to us before. Anyway, so that song was a riff on trying to parse out how do you make a band and keep it meaningful to you and and maintain the integrity of it when you're starting to think about it with that money stuff. Yeah, I mean, a lot of your songs are are really politicized. Like you have Pink White House and it's like, anything you want. It's like a lot about like kind of greed and systemic this, that, and the other. <laughs> now, now I'm telling her what her songs are about. Um, it's okay. <laughs> but then there was this song, JJ. And mm-hmm. I was like, that sounds like it's kind of about something different, like a little bit more personal as political. <laughs> Uh, I don't usually write uh, like first person confessional lyrics Uh, in this record too I like to think the lyrics in a sense of being like little vignettes or like short stories in a collection but that one is like yeah it's pretty uh, just my life Borat voice 
my life. Um, I remember they had texted me about like a solo tape that I put out being like, yeah, cool, like I'll check that out. And then they were like pretty quiet. Uh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, that they like heard the lyrics and, and figured it out. And I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they don't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> like, but I don't really care because you know, it's my life and it happened to me and, and like, I don't know, I'm going to make money off of it. Shit. <laughs> like, well, everyone has their truth, right? Like yeah. it, my whole thing is like, if you are bold enough to do something like that to me, then you stand tall and proud and I'm right. sing about it and you own it. Right. I'm sure it's the type of thing where like, I don't really talk to this person anymore and it's probably weird and bad to like hear, like, remember when you were 18 and like, were shitty to me. But it's yeah. a good message, I think, to give to a lot of guys, because obviously it's not individualized it's like about how these patterns of behavior yeah affect women, yeah women in society you know yeah I stand by the lyrics and like whoever deserves anything what a stupid concept you just you know sometimes you get lucky and then sometimes you get fucked and we're fucked yeah yeah <laughs> we're in a, a pretty fucked time right now so yeah this writer, Laura Snapes for Pitchfork. Oh, yeah. I really loved, I love her writing anyways. But I, I love what she wrote about you guys. Yeah. But she talked about accelerationism. And I was thinking like this idea, which happened during the Bush era, and it seems to be happening again with Trump, where people are like, yeah, but it always makes for really good punk music. And like when we're in these horrible right wing hell holes, you know, then it makes for like people are actually get radicalized and things are going to really change. I mean, people are literally dying in our country every day because they don't have health care. They can't afford to take care of their families. Uh, they're being murdered for the color of their skin or their sexual identity. Or, like, there's just... Our country is so, so, so incredibly fucked. So if your perspective and your, like, takeaway on that is, like, at least music is going to become politicized and good, I would strongly encourage you to expand your community and who you talk to because, like, if you are so isolated from the horrors of the world right now that that's your thought, then, like, I don't think that you have a very good perspective on what's happening. I also think, though, that, like, when we get in social situations, people often just feel this compulsion to, like, put an optimistic spin on things. And... Uh, sometimes you don't need to do that. <laughs> we can just talk about how it's shitty. It's fine. <laughs> All right, priests, peoples. Thank you so much for having yeah. us. This has Thank been really you, Allison. In the Band is produced by me, Allison Wolf, And me, Jonathan Shifflett. You can hear all of our episodes on Title On Air and follow us at I'm In The Band Podcast. Hey